A hedge full of enormous, juicy, blossoming hydrangeas spilling over the curb is one of the most gorgeous aspects of any garden or home front vista, right? It's giving class. It's giving regal. In different cultures, hydrangeas can mean abundance or heartfelt emotion, gratitude, or even boastfulness. Whatever hydrangea mean to you, they are certainly a showstopper both in the garden and in the vase. Now, if you have heard about growing hydrangea, you'll likely know that there are a few things that can be a little bit finicky when getting them set up. But once you plant them correctly, it's a set it and forget it situation. But you do have to know a few specific things about your environment in order to make your hydrangea thrive and get those enormous blooms that we all love so much. So today, to ensure that you have a season of gorgeous blooming hydrangea that bring you so much joy and no stress, we dedicate a whole episode to their care. Welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant friends, I'm Maria, your new best plant friend. I'm here to help you care for plants successfully and grow joy in your life while doing so. If you're new here, hello. If you're returning, welcome home. I'm so honored to be part of your planty journey and to be able to make these free episodes for you on a weekly basis. And speaking of, if you've been enjoying the episodes, please take a moment to pick your favorite episode of the podcast you've listened to lately and text it to one of your plant friends. Because today, I'm introducing you to one of my new plant friends. I don't know if you've ever like been at a plant event or just an event in general and met someone who you knew was going to be like a real friend for life. I felt this when I met today's guest, Ryan McKenney. When I met him in Seattle at the Northwestern Flower Show a couple of weeks ago, we went to dinner and it was uncanny how many things we had in common. And I just could tell that this guy was going to be a real friend of mine. Plus, he is a treasure trove of plant care information because he is the fifth generation of Bailey Nursery. They are known for their endless summer hydrangeas, which are like the top hydrangeas in the country. They also have Easy Elegance Roses and First Edition Shrubs. So if you know any of those names, that's Ryan's family's company. And he has spent kind of his whole life with hydrangea in his blood. And because of that, it's given him so much knowledge on all of the intricacies of caring for hydrangea and how to really get the plants that we all love so much and are jealous of as we drive by and see huge hedges of hydrangeas spilling over the curb. I don't know why, but that's just the vision that I have from growing up. Like we had neighbors that had this just epic hedge of hydrangea. Every time you walked by, they were just like abundant with blooms and it was so amazing. So anyway... This is such an in-depth interview. Ryan has so much information to give you. You are going to be so confident about your hydrangea growing game at the end of this episode. I don't want to waste another minute, but I will just take one minute to let you know that if you love these in-depth care guides, like the hydrangea care guide, the philodendron care guide, the calathea care guide, I actually did a citrus care video on YouTube. So if you're interested in growing citrus this summer, you could also hop over to my YouTube channel. I'll link it in the show notes to go have a deep dive on citrus care, how to grow citrus indoors. So anyway, this is all about how to grow hydrangea outdoor. You'll see that I get very inspired at the end of the episode. I might be growing some hydrangea myself this year. So without further ado, here is Ryan McKenney. Ryan, my new best plant friend. I'm so excited (laughs) to have you on the podcast. Hello, hello, hello. It's so great to be here. It's so funny. I mean, we've had ads for your book on the podcast before, but I've never met you. And then when we met in person in Seattle, I was like, where have you been all my life? (laughs) I know we got back and I was telling my husband, like, I think I found this person that is exactly me, like down to the fact that our sisters are both having babies at the same time. At the same time. Everything. (laughs) In female form, exactly. Yes, like you, exactly. the interior young, right? I know. So excited. So excited about this new plant friendship and what will become of it. Because you're also a Broadway baby, which makes me yes. so happy. Yes. I know. I can't wait to sing together. It's going to be so fun. I know. Here's to <laughs> lots of musical collaborations in the future. I feel like neither of us quite understand what they'll look like, but we're going to make it happen. 
Yeah, of course. It's going to be so fun. Maybe surrounded by hydrangeas. Yes. I'm so excited to chat with you about hydrangeas today because ever since I was a kid, I feel like I've always loved hydrangeas so much. I grew up in an area where so many people had like hedges of them. And in the spring and summer, it was like they were blossoming so intensely that the plants could barely keep the flowers up. And I just think that look is so incredible. And my husband is from Cape Cod, obviously an area where hydrangeas are kind of iconic. So I was telling you offline, I can't believe we've had 230 episodes and I've never done an an episode on them because they're kind of a specific plant you need a specific skill set for. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And I also think that hydrangeas have a reputation of being more finicky than they are, partially because a lot of times they get overworked and then they get less blooms. So we're going to work through that today and we're going to help people have success with them so they can have those big, beautiful hedges. So they're like the succulents. Yes. A succulent (laughs) in the houseplant world is the hydrangea to the gardener. Before we dive into hydrangea care, I have so many questions I want to ask you. How did you become the the king of hydrangeas? Like what has your plant parent journey looked like? So mine has been sort of meandering to get here. Like so many of us, I feel like that live in this world of plants every day. So I grew up surrounded by plants. I am a fifth generation nursery owner, but I was not a horticulture major. I did not start my career in horticulture. I started in entertainment, living in LA and doing that whole thing. And then 10 years ago, I came back and started working back at the family business. And one of the brands we own is called Endless Summer Hydrangeas, which is the best-selling collection of hydrangea in the world. And we're celebrating 20 years of Endless Summer in 2024. And I started doing our PR and our social, and then I became the spokesperson. And so it was like trial by fire. Like you come in and you learn all of the things right now because you have to be able to go on TV and give people advice on it. And so I learned really quickly. And then the last 10 years of doing it in practice in my own garden and gardens all around the country where we get to install them. So it's been really fun. Yeah, I feel like live TV is definitely probably the scariest for any of us to do because you never know what's going to happen on live TV. And they could. I was on Tamron Hall for my book launch. I worked with her producers for two weeks putting together my segment. I brought soil samples. We had a whole setup. We covered the stage in plants. And then in the middle of her interview, she was like, you know, I have a plant that isn't doing well. Can I show you a picture of it? And can you tell me what to do? And I was like, this is not part of our script, ma'am. Correct. Correct. (laughs) So you need to understand all your hydrangea facts, definitely on a deeper level. Did you grow up caring for them when, you know, you were in the nursery and stuff? or, Or were you kind of numb to them as a kid and you only had to kind of develop your passion? Yeah, I mean, I was surrounded by it. And especially hydrangeas and roses, like there's a lot of nostalgia just sort of like built into those plants in general. But because I was always around it, it was like, oh, yeah, you know, that's what my mom does. She works at this company. And when I worked here growing up, it was like unloading semis of trees. So like, it was like the hard physical labor, which Now, I'm really grateful that I had that experience and understand what it means to actually have a production nursery, but it wasn't like, oh, this is what I want to do forever. I had this inkling that I wanted to be back in the business because the legacy component is really important to me to continue that and more importantly, take care of our employees and make sure that they have a really solid future at Bailey. But it wasn't like, I want to be a plant person. That came later. What does your garden look like right now? So I was just looking at it yesterday because we had some trees that came down. So now I have a lot more sun. So my garden is always a work in progress. And we bought our house two and a half years ago, specifically because there was a blank slate of land to develop. So I'm always playing in it. And because we also have a breeding company that introduces these new hydrangeas and other plants, I have stuff that I get to trial that are 2026, 2027 introductions So I have like little pockets in the back where where it's hidden away that I get to play with the new stuff too. That's so funny. Yeah, my husband and I are starting to look at property and the first survey is, okay, but what does the lawn look like? Like, what does the (laughs) land look like? I could care less if what the kitchen looks like, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Yeah, you got to have places to play outside. That's amazing. So you must have like a test garden. Yeah. That's so cool. 
So let's dive into hydrangea. They're a mystery to me, even though I admire them from afar. I've never had one. I've never cared for one. So I'm a total noob for this conversation. What's the deal with the variety? Like what genus do they come from? And then also, are well, are they one genus, one like, I guess, genus species family? And I've seen on Instagram, like some hydrangeas that look like trees. And then I've seen some that look like bushes and I see little ones in containers. And then I see these hedges that I grew up admiring that are six feet tall. So can we talk about just like the variety of hydrangeas that people can bring home? Because I would assume maybe there are mistakes made here that you bring the wrong type home for your environment. Definitely. Yeah, there are four main species that you'll find at a garden center. So the first one that is a North American native species is a smooth hydrangea or hydrangea arborescence. So if you know Annabelle or like the big snowball type, that is a smooth hydrangea. So that's one. Then there's the ones that have a cone-shaped flower. So like the tree form that you see, that's called a panicle hydrangea or hydrangea paniculata is the Latin name for it. So those are the cone shape that bloom white in like early to midsummer and then will change color for fall. That's hydrangea paniculata. The blooms will change color for fall? Yes. So there's two different types where the blooms will change color. The paniculata will bloom white, and then they will age to, depending on the variety, like a parchment, a pink, or some of them like a really deep red. So those are great. Then there's another native species to North America called oak leaf hydrangea or hydrangea quercifolia. And as the name suggests, the leaf actually is shaped like an oak tree. This is one that's like, it's native to the southeast, like kind of a woodland type hydrangea. It blooms earlier in the season. It also has kind of a cone shaped flower, but a little more rounded than the paniculata. But you can really tell by the leaf on this one. So this one we love because it blooms a little bit earlier. So it gets you that first part of the season. And then the fall color on the foliage is spectacular. It's like a beautiful oak tree, especially there's a variety I love called Jetstream that has like deep, almost Merlot colored leaves in the fall. So like, we love that one. And then the one that you see probably the most out there is a big leaf hydrangea or hydrangea macrophylla. And those are also like a snowball like bloom, but smaller than the smooth hydrangea. This is the one where you see the blues and the pinks and the purples, some white as well. But these are the really, really colorful hydrangeas. So those are big leaf. So those are the four main ones that you see. And the different type is determined by the shape of their flower, or I guess the expression of the flower. Yep, that's the easiest way to like immediately make a guess at what you're looking at. And can there be large and small varieties in each different type of the four categories? Oh, yeah. And this is honestly where we get a lot of questions because there are so many and there are so many new varieties that come out that it's like, okay, where do I even start? But that's what it's all about. It's finding like, what does your space offer? What sun do you have? What does your soil look like? And then how big of a space do you want it to mature into? All those things help you sort of like take that really broad brush of here's what hydrangeas offer and narrow it down into what works for you. And the different categories of hydrangea, do they have different care or is it a general hydrangea kind of care guide for all four? Yeah, there's a little bit of a a different care tips for each of them. The biggest thing to understand is if they bloom on last season's growth or the current season's growth. That will help, especially with pruning, because this is what really can trip people up with maximizing the blooms. So at a very base level, if you're trying to maximize your flowers, just don't do a hard prune. That'll be like your easiest. But within each, I can help give you like a little bit more in depth. So if you're looking at the smooth hydrangea, which is that really big snowball one, like an Annabelle type, that one blooms on current season's growth. So if it gets pruned back, not a problem. You're still going to get flowers. Some people will cut it all the way back to the ground, especially when they're cleaning up their perennials. That's fine. There's been some really great research, the Mount Cuba Center. So people are looking for research, especially when it comes to like native species or like these big categories. Mount Cuba Center in Delaware has awesome research. But they did some around pruning and they found that if you leave the smooth hydrangea like half up, you're going to get stronger stems. So it's one of those where it's like, 
If you want to leave it half up, great. If you want to cut it back to the ground, fine. It doesn't really matter. It's still going to bloom for you. So that's smooth hydrangeas. Panicle, those cone-shaped, those are cut it back by about a half in late winter. Those also bloom on your current season's growth. So again, since it's blooming on the new growth, the pruning isn't as big of a deal. But if you cut it back by half, that's going to get you stronger stems and more branching. If you have ever had watering stress when it comes to the plants you grow in containers, you are going to love this next sponsor plant, friends. Say goodbye. Say goodbye to balcony watering stress this summer with Crescent Garden True Drop self-watering planters. For 25 years, Crescent Garden has been a beacon of blending beauty and function in their containers, and I am thrilled to simplify my gardening journey with them. I have been stalking, and I mean stalking, their nest elevated self-watering planter for months on the internet, and I can't believe I finally have one. I'm completely overhauling my balcony with their True Drop planters. They are sleek, they are lightweight, easy to plant up and effortless to maintain, and they have a smart patented water level indicator for foolproof watering. Plus, they come in various shapes, sizes, and chic colors. It took me two days to decide between whether or not I was going to go with their deep green option that they have or their rustic weathered terracotta to match any home aesthetic, all while saving water and fertilizer usage. Did I mention that they are 100% recyclable, come with a 10-year limited warranty, and come at a variety of price points, plant friends, functionality, beauty, and sustainability? Come on! What more can you ask for? And here's the best part, okay? If you want to hop on the Crescent Garden planter bandwagon like I am this year with my balcony and say goodbye to watering stress, you can get 15% off for a limited time. Head to growingjoywithmaria.com slash Crescent Garden. The link is also going to be in the show notes and use code GROWJOY15, GROWJOY15 to curate your dream garden today. Act fast. The offer ends soon for 15% off the Crescent Garden planters of your dreams. Go to growingjoywithmaria.com slash Crescent Garden and use code GROWJOY15 at checkout for 15% off. On an episode about hydrangea, I had to mention a book about growing cut flowers. If you are on your cut flower growing journey plant friends, you should probably check out the Cut Flower Handbook by professional flower farmer Lisa Ziegler. It is the bouquet building Bible for gardeners that you have been waiting for. So included in the Cut Flower Handbook are 50 extensive flower profiles, planting tips, instructions and images on how to pinch flower plants, how to make your cuts, how to dig a planting bed, and more. Plus, there's over 200 photos of the best cut flowers for home gardeners to grow and advice on caring for a gorgeous, sustainable, prolific cutting garden. Accessible to everyone at every level of gardening, the Cut Flower Handbook is your gorgeously illustrated, all-encompassing guide to growing your own cut flowers at home. Pick it up at your favorite local bookstore, bookshop.org, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon.com. That's the Cut Flower Handbook by Lisa Ziegler, wherever books are sold. Okay, before we dive into these, let's zoom out just a little bit broader. When you're talking about blooming on the current season or the old season's growth, maybe would it be helpful to walk through like what the life cycle of a hydrangea looks like in terms of what does that mean? So does that mean the growth of the stem of the season that I'm in is where the bloom spikes are coming from versus that growth isn't going to have blooms, but it's going to be the old woodier growth. Can you walk us through that for anyone who might be confused? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hydrangeas do develop those woody stems and some have the ability to produce flower buds on that woody stem. So that's when we say it blooms on old wood or previous season's growth. That's where you can see some of those flower buds develop. A lot of them will only develop blooms on new growth. So like those smooth hydrangeas and panicle, the flower bud does not develop on that woody stem, but on the new growth, but that woody stem, obviously, especially with those really big flowers, you want that to be really hardy. So it will hold those big flower heads up and not flop over like you were talking about at the beginning. Okay. So if it blooms on the new growth, you want to prune it back pretty aggressively so that the new growth that comes in is what's getting you the blooms. And pruning it back will increase the branching too. The amount of branches. Okay, Ryan. Okay. Which also the opportunity for more flowers. 
So pruning is affecting flower, but also the sturdiness of the stems. Right, because of that, like the hedge I was talking about, how it was like the hedge could barely even hold up all of the blooms that were toppling out of it. So you need that combo of sturdy old growth. Exactly. So when you're talking about pruning, are you pruning at the end of the season or are you pruning at the beginning of the season? So my preference is to do late winter for a couple of reasons. One is at least then you leave some interest up for the winter months. So it's prettier for us, especially if you're in a place that gets snow. It's like a beautiful way to collect some of the snow and you don't just have a barren landscape. But also it's really important for your native insects and pollinators. So they have a home to live in the winter. So I leave those up and then just cut them back in late winter. Depending on where you are, that could be February, it could be April, whenever you can get out and work in the landscape. Got it. So the first type, the smooth hydrangea, you're pruning then because it's coming in on the new growth. Did you say pinnacle, the more cone shaped? The panicle, yep. Panicle, you're pruning also similarly. Correct. Then what's the next variety? So then the other two, the oak leaf and the big leaf, bloom on. So let's say we're in February, we're in March, we're spring of 2024. The flower buds for this year were set like August of 2023. So they got to go to sleep before they bloom. Yes. And so if you cut them back, you're cutting off the flower. (gasps) Oh, no. So especially like the colorful big leaf hydrangeas, and we're like, why isn't my hydrangea blooming? Well, either it got cut back and you cut the flower buds off or a husband went out and did it or or Mother Nature did it because you had a really extreme winter and it zapped those flower buds. So that can happen. So that's why oak leaf hydrangeas are typically better in warmer climates because they won't have those extremes that will kill that old wood flower bud. So that one you prune after it flowers, you just deadhead that flower. So you go to the, the crunchy flower head that's on top Go to that first set of two large alternating leaves and prune right above it, and you're done. That's it. And you're done. And then also, I have to say, I want to ask you about this later, but I was just at my friend's house. She has an epic hydrangea, and she had this stunning vase that just had like two or three dried hydrangea blooms, and it looked so beautiful, especially for the winter up here where, you know, we're in the woods. It's miserable. It was just the most beautiful, natural, gorgeous arrangement. She's like, yeah, I literally just cut them off. So... That's super interesting. Okay, cool. Well, wow. I'm like, we can end the episode there. That was super informative. (laughs) Well, the other thing that I feel like I don't know much about hydrangeas, but I do know that their bloom color is dependent on the soil, which is not the normal case for a lot of other plants. So can you talk about how the soil is going to affect the blooms? So this is only for one species of hydrangea. So it's the big leaf hydrangea, which I just mentioned blooms on old wood. There are some more plants now that bloom on old and new. So Endless Summer was the first one to have that reblooming capability. There are others now that in that big leaf category that are old and new growth. So even if you have that that die back in the winter, they actually get cut back. They have that ability to rebloom. So this is also the same type that can change flower color. So what it's based on is the pH of your soil. So whether you have acidic or alkaline soil, and the presence or lack of aluminum. So it's like a little science to figure it out. But if you have alkaline soil, or if you have a higher pH, you're going to naturally get pink blooms or pink or red. If you have acidic soil and there's aluminum in the soil, you're going to have a lower pH, which means you're going to get blue or purple somewhere in that. So if you've got one and you want the other, you can manipulate the soil. And over time, it's not going to be instant. But over time, you can change the flower head on your big leaf hydrangea. And how do I figure out my soil acidity? There's a test I can do with my uh, local extension, right? Yeah, you can get a soil kit from a local garden center and they can do a pretty easy, like at least give you a general idea on where you are. You know, if you're in the six, six and a half range, you're fairly neutral. If you're above that, you're alkaline. Below that, you're acidic. But if you want to really get all the details, then bring a soil sample to your extension office. And they can do like the full run, not only for your acidity, your alkalinity, but all of the other elements that are in the soil to make sure that you've got the healthy stuff. Yeah, a couple of garden guests that we've had on before talk about getting your soil tested before you plant an, a vegetable garden or anything so you can understand that how healthy the soil is and what you need to amend. 
I guess another way you can figure it out is plant one of those hydrangea and see if it turns blue or pink, and then you'll know which which way you're going. Yeah, see what happens. <laughs> okay, but that's only for that specific big leaf hydrangea. But that is what we tend to see a lot of, right? Is that the most popular of the four varieties? Yeah, especially if you think of like Cape Cod and like all those beautiful pictures. Those are all big leaf hydrangeas. Really, the ones that you'll see most, big leaf, probably number one. Regionally, like in the upper Midwest, we see a ton of smooth hydrangeas. You can't drive through Minneapolis where I am and not see like every yard has an Annabelle type hydrangea in there. And then in the Southeast, you see a lot of the oak leaf where they're native. So on the national level, big leaf is where you're going to see the most. Yeah. Okay, cool. So adding a soil acidifier, or you can tinker with it depending on, but that's just going to the garden center or buying the soil. I know Espoma. Espoma is our soil partner. I notice you guys have them all over your YouTube videos. They have a soil acidifier. So you would be like sprinkling that in your soil, but knowing that it's probably not this year, it's going to change over time, right? This is like a process. Yeah, it kind of depends where you're starting. Like if you're really alkaline and you want to get blue flowers, it might take a couple of years. If you're kind of in that neutral space, you might see it a lot faster. And so you sprinkle the soil acidifier if you want to go from pink to blue, do it around the whole drip line of the plant. And all that means is like go to your outermost edges of the stems and go all the way down. That's where the roots live. So make sure you cover that whole area. And if you want to go from blue to pink, uh, you add garden lime and that'll raise the pH. Okay. Garden lot. Okay, that's what that's for. Yes. What about containers versus in ground? My favorite topic. I love talking about this because I actually just gave a talk this weekend about using shrubs and containers. And I asked the audience to raise their hand to say, like, yep, I garden in containers. Most raised their hand, whether it was veggies or flowers. And I said, now keep your hand up if you use shrubs and containers. And almost everyone put their hands down. Because they don't think about using shrub because, you know, anything about a woody plant, you assume it's going to get massive, right? Well, there are some newer varieties that genetically are just more compact. So they're easier to have in containers, not only for one season, but you can overwinter them and have them come back year after year after year, which is super, super fun. So overwintering them, putting them in your garage somewhere that, you know, is a little bit more climate controlled and then putting them back out. Yeah. So if you're in a cold area like we are, Either bring them into an unheated garage, give them about a cup of water or a big snowball every month because they, even though they're dormant, they still need a little moisture. Or if you're in a little bit warmer, you know, zone six, seven, eight, you can just tuck them in a protected space outside of the house. Really, what you're trying to protect them from is the wind, especially. The wind is really what can damage, especially because the roots are more exposed because they're outside of the ground. But it's a great way to have them come back year after year. So, Varieties like Pop Star, Hydrangea, which is really compact, Little Hottie, things like that that will stay small. Isn't that fun? <laughs> little Hottie. <laughs> That's a cute name. Yeah. Those are great for deco pots and they can live all on their own. Or if you want to dress them up with some annuals or some seasonal, like we we're talking about this weekend, some cool like seasonal veggies and have like an ornamental edible mix is great. But if you've got a relatively small pot, just throw a hydrangea in there and it's going to be great all season and it's going to come back next year and you don't have to mess with it. Yeah, I love that. I'm a grow bag gardener right now because we still rent. Never thought to put hydrangeas in a grow bag. Yeah, I love that idea of just also just adding some fun like visual interest. But I love micro edibles like my, I have the miniature cucumbers and the tomatoes and the eggplants like I grow everything micro. And so I'm like, oh, maybe I should try your smallest hydrangea this year in a grow bag and see how that goes. Well, we might have to get a pop star out to you. Yeah, we might have to we have a pop star. How fitting pop star, right? A, <laughs> a singer, a singing hydrangea. <laughs> I love that. So, OK, what do I need to know about planting hydrangeas in ground? What's the basic planting tutorial? So, again, it, a little bit depends on the species, if you're how much sun you're going to get. But pay attention to that. So just check what species you're at, you're planting and understand where they can live. Most will require at least morning sun, if not full day sun. So just pay attention to what you've got in your yard, watch it for a little while, understand how much access to that sunlight you have. Depending on how big your pot is, do about twice the width and about the depth of the pot that you purchased, pop it out, dump it in. And if you need to do a little soil amending while you're at it, whether it's to change the color or because you've got really heavy clay, for example, and you need to break that up because hydrangeas, 
even though they have the name Hydra in it, does not mean that they like to be drowned in water. They just like even moisture. So if you've got really heavy clay, for example, you're going to want to mix in something to break that up and then fill it back in, give it a really good soaking of water, and you're off to the races. They're pretty darn easy. The hydrangea isn't like a tomato where you're planting it deeper. You, you want to plant it at the line that they came with in its pot. Correct. Yep, just flush. But you want to give it a little bit wider. Okay, cool. You mentioned light. So what's a general light guideline? So no, this isn't a shade plant. This needs light to kind of get those gorgeous blooms. Yeah, you can plant them in shade. You just won't have as many flowers. But the two species that can take more shade are the oak leaf and the smooth hydrangea. They're both generally woodland plants anyways, but they're still going to want at least a few hours of at least dappled morning sun, if not full sun in the morning. That's really what's going to get the most blooms for you. Okay, cool. Any like common mistakes you see people making with planting? Planting, it can be planting too high or planting too low. Those for sure will do it. Hydrangeas are pretty shallow rooted plants. So if they get planted too low, then it can sort of drown the crown of the plant, not only with the soil, but also water as it gets collected when you're watering it in well when you plant it. Or if you plant it too high, again, because the roots are pretty shallow, it can dry out really easily. So just make sure that they stay flush. And then the other piece, like we already talked about, really is that sun exposure. It's a really important piece of uh, to maximize the blooms, making sure that you're planting in the right spot. Get ready for a pinch me moment, plant friends. I am thrilled to announce that Gardner Supply Company is the newest partner of the podcast. For years, I have been swooning over their gardening goodies like a kid in a candy store. Every turn of the year when it's about to be gardening time, I always go on gardeners.com to see what things they have to beautify my garden or make it easier to care for. If you remember those stunning raised beds I installed in my mom's garden and my sister's garden, those were the Gardener's Cedar raised beds. And Gardener's is an employee-owned company run by passionate gardeners that's been around for over 50 years. So whether you have acres or just a balcony, Gardener's has you covered with everything you need for successful indoor and outdoor growing. From containers to raised beds, seeds to plant supports, they've got it all to create your dream garden oasis. They even sell edging and walkways so you can make your garden or your restorative, you know, garden oasis as beautiful and accessible as possible. Follow me on Instagram to see a couple of updates I'll be making to my garden with Gardener's Supply Company. But don't just take it from me. Head over to gardeners.com slash growing joy and use code growing joy for free shipping. Discover all of your garden favorites and exclusive innovations at gardeners.com slash growing joy and use code growing joy for free shipping. All right. If you are interested in growing hydrangea this year to set yourself up for success, you should absolutely use Espoma Organic products. Ryan himself uses them, as we've discussed in today's episode. Espoma Organic has been making high quality plant products for people, pets and the planet for almost a century, 90 plus years. So if after this episode, you get inspired and you're going to grow hydrangea, they have a line of organic, high quality products to help them thrive. So if you're planting your hydrangea in containers, you should use the Espoma Organic Potting Mix or the Espoma Organic Raised Bed Mix if you're planting in raised beds. And then if you're planting in the ground, you can make sure to use their garden soil and amend with their land and sea compost. Then when planting the hydrangea, you're going to sprinkle in some biotone starter plant food, which is enhanced with beneficial microbes and mycorrhizae that help the plants establish faster and grow deeper roots and bigger blooms. So planting, when you put the plant in the ground or in the pot, you're going to use the biotone. And then you're going to follow up and feed the plants throughout the growing season with their line of fertilizers, which are called tones. So in this episode, you learn that there are some acid and some alkaline loving hydrangeas. Hollytone is Espoma's like premium product. It's a long lasting, slow releasing fertilizer created for acid loving plants. So hydrangeas do great with Hollytone, or you could also use flower tone or plant tone if you have alkaline soil. However you're growing them, grow big, gorgeous hydrangeas with Espoma Organic and their incredible line of products. You can go to espoma.com to look at their entire line of planty products for indoor and outdoor plants, and then find your local dealer there. Or you can go to my Amazon storefront, which is linked in the show notes for a list of my preferred Espoma products. Yeah, let's get into the bloom talk because that's what we're planting hydrangeas for the blooms. We're not planting them for the right. leaves. <laughs> so the first season I plant my hydrangea, can I expect blooms? 
And any tips for like, if I'm at the garden center and I'm looking for a hydrangea, should I pick one that has no blooms on it? Should I pick one that ha- already has a bloom on it? And what am I doing to ensure as many juicy, big, gorgeous, ideally pink for me blooms as possible? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked this question because when I'm out in garden centers giving talks and helping people shop, they they tend to gravitate towards the most beautiful full flowered plant that is there because we want that instant gratification. But when you're there, find those that are budded. So it's like with hydrangeas, they look like little baby broccolis because those flower buds have already developed. So you know you're going to get flowers from it this season rather than if you find it where it's all vegetative, it's just going to take a little bit longer for those buds to develop. So if you have an event this weekend and you really need flowers, buy it in color. Otherwise, find the broccoli and buy those. That's the best advice for now. Okay. Find the broccoli. Yes. Okay, find the broccoli because then those blooms after you plant, assuming that it doesn't go through so much transplant shock, they're going to come. Is a hydrangea a plant that really suffers with transplant shock? Or if you do what you know you just told us to, we can pretty much anticipate blooms that summer. The biggest thing is when you're planting. So like, if you're planting in spring or fall, great. You're you should be in pretty darn good shape. If you're planting where it's going to be really hot, that's where it's going to struggle a little bit as it starts to get established. So just if you're planting in a really warm season, if you're planting in summer, make sure that you're keeping that soil moist. And you don't want it to get drowned. You don't want it to be loaded with water every day, but that's really what's going to protect it. And you might see even if with established hydrangeas, you might see that they start to flop a little bit in the the mid-afternoon sun, especially if you live in a really hot climate. That's the hydrangea's natural defense mechanism. That doesn't necessarily mean it needs water, even though, again, like it's our gut instinct. We see a plant wilting, like, "Ah, we got to water it and bring it back to life. The best thing to do is check the soil, go down to your second knuckle and see if the soil is dry. If so, give it a really good soak. If it's not, leave it alone. Or... My personal favorite is leave it alone, have a glass of wine, get a beer, get a cocktail, a mocktail, and just enjoy your night. And if it's still drooped over in the morning, then give it a good soak. But a lot of times it just needs those cooler nighttime temperatures and it'll pop right back up. I was at some sort of florist demonstration and don't hydrangea drink through their flowers. Like if you need to revive a drooping hydrangea that's cut, you can soak the the head of the hydrangea. Yeah, you can. It's great if you're doing a cut flower arrangement and you're pulling it from the garden and you're like, oh my God, people are coming over in 10 minutes and it did that drooping thing. You can dunk the head in or like if it's in the garden and you need it to spritz, like wake up quickly, you can just spray the flower head as well. And that will help pop it back up, even if it's just somewhat temporary. That's a fun trick. I like that. Yes. (laughs) We all love a good party trick, right? We all love a good party (laughs) trick. What about fertilizing? This is a really good one because this is another one where we tend to overdo it in the garden because we really want to get all those flowers. But the way that I think about fertilizer is most of them just need an even application maybe once a year. 10, 10, 10, garden fertilizer is fine. The one where you pay a little more attention is the big leaf hydrangea, those really colorful ball-shaped flowers with the flat lace cap ones. And everything in my life revolves around food and drinks. And so... The way that I remember this is in spring, when you start to see the green leafy growth, give it a shot of fertilizer. This one, find a bloom booster. And you know, when you look at the NPK ratio, the middle number is the phosphorus or phosphate. That's the one you want to be a little higher. So find a bloom booster, find one that has higher phosphorus because the nitrogen just promotes green leafy growth, which is great but we're buying hydrangeas for flowers. So we want we want one that is a bloom booster. Apply it in spring when you see that green leafy growth. That's like Red Bull or like, nope, we're not there yet. That's coffee. We have the coffee in the morning. That's that. Then we get to July-ish, especially for the rebloomers. That's your Red Bull. Give it another shot in July. That's it. You don't need to do it all the time. Sometimes even the package instructions will say apply weekly, apply monthly. You don't need to do that. That can actually burn the root system with too much fertilizer, and that'll stop promoting flowers. Interesting. I'm assuming hydrangea tone has higher P in it. A spoma has a, a hydrangea tone, right? They have a rose tone. Oh, rose tone. Okay. And actually, the rose tone works really well with these, that it is a bloom booster. 
They also have a bloom boosting formulation. I think it's Holly Tone, I believe, is the one that oh, yeah. has the, the bloom boosting in it. The purple package. Yeah, that's the, the one, one to get. <laughs> yep. So that's what we use in our garden. And then so coffee Shout in out. spring. Yeah. And summer, you get that Red Bull. That's all you need. Same for us. Like if we had 17 coffees a day, we'd be, well, probably acting like this. And I don't even drink coffee, but we'd be <laughs> bouncing off the walls. Same with the hydrangeas. Like just give them a little bit here and a little bit there. And that's enough. It's funny. This is sounding much more low maintenance than I thought it was going to be. Well, and that's the that's why I love to have these conversations, because they do have that reputation of being really hard and they don't need to be. You can kind of like set it and forget it almost as long as you make sure that soil that soil stays moist. But other than that, leave them alone and let them do what they're supposed to do. And you're checking the soil in your garden for the most part. Like if you have a garden, you're likely checking your soil anyway. So I don't know why I feel like I thought hydrangeas were going to be this like very high maintenance, maybe because their flowers are so showy and delicate. I just assume it's going to be harder, but you're getting me like really. Yeah, you're getting me really stoked. They look like a diva, but they don't have they don't act like it. (laughs) Yeah, right. I'm like, am I a hydrangea? Is hydrangea my plant? (laughs) Okay, what other questions do I have? So what are other common mistakes in general you see people making? It sounds like that pruning thing. I mean, could you imagine bringing home a hydrangea and then accidentally pruning off those blooms? That makes me sad. Yeah, pruning, the sun exposure, overwatering. So again, just make sure that the soil, soil stays moist. If it's flopping over in the afternoon, just let it be for a hot second. Don't overwater because what that does is it pushes the nutrients and the oxygen out of the soil. And without that, obviously, it can't respirate and create have the energy to produce the flowers. So really, those are the biggest thing. And then the over fertilizing. Without that, you can just kind of enjoy, sit back and enjoy them. Is there anything you can do to extend the length of the blooms that you get? Really, the watering is the biggest piece of it. It's the watering. Okay. Yep. That's really what's going to help, especially if you're in a warmer climate and they're getting some of that afternoon sun. Even if you have the panicle hydrangea, which can grow in full sun, if you make sure that that soil stays moist, especially during those really hot days, that's what's going to keep them really fresh late in the season. Combined then with if you've got a big leaf hydrangea that reblooms, giving that second shot of fertilizer allows you to have the, the first set of flowers start to fade, which a lot of them stay really nice colors. Like Bloomstruck is one of my favorites because it blooms either like a really beautiful, like intense pink color or a like we call it blurple blue purple color if you have acidic soil but then it ages to like this beautiful maroon and then you have the fresh new flowers coming out with the rebloom late in the season where then you've got the blue purple plus you've got the maroon next to it so it's like a little rainbow of color all on one plant which i love when you're saying rebloom, it's not the same bud reblooming it's that there's going to be one bud and then on the new growth, and then the old growth is going to bloom. So you have that the old growth that puts out that first set of flowers. And then as that starts to fade and like harden a little bit on the stem, the new stems are coming out and producing new flowers. So you've got sort of like this endless cascade all the way until really you get to your first freeze. And what is that? So you were saying only recently now there have been these species that have been developed to do the old and new growth. So What should we be looking for at the garden center to try and get one of those? So anything in endless summer, they're all rebloomers. And this is the first ever reblooming hydrangea to exist. And we keep working at better and better genetics. So like Popstar that I mentioned, we just introduced last year. It is the fastest to rebloom. It is twice as fast as any other hydrangea we had in trial, not just ours, but any hydrangea on the market. It reblooms twice as fast, which is great in the landscape, but especially great for those of us in cold climates where sometimes the winter will kill those old wood buds. Then we don't have to wait till September for that rebloom to kick in. Then we can actually get those flowers in July when you would expect to see them. And it will keep putting out flowers all the way through September, October, November, depending on where you live. So all the endless summer are rebloomers. But the, and the newest ones just continue to get better and better with number of flowers, bud hardiness, uh, speed to rebloom. So those are the Bloomstruck, Summer Crush, and Popstar that I mentioned. One, you're going to find in most places, and two, are like the best bloomers and rebloomers out there. 
then it sounds like for a beginner, like, I, I mean, is there a beginner hydrangea versus a non beginner, or it's they're pretty much all the same care, right? So I guess, well, yeah, is that true? More or less, the the big leaf do take a little bit more because of this old wood, new wood situation. So like, if you want one that is like foolproof, the smooth hydrangea and the panicle hydrangeas, since they bloom on new growth, doesn't matter what happened in the winter. If you're looking for somewhere to start, get a smooth hydrangea, especially if you've got a little more shade. If you've got a full sun area, you can tolerate some shade, but full sun, which sometimes is really hard to find plants that can withstand that full sun, that heat all the way through summer and fall. Then panicle, easy. Like limelight is, from Proven Winners is one that most people will know. Vanilla Strawberry from First Editions, which is another brand that we own, is another one that is pervasive and everywhere. There's great new ones. There's one called Berry White that I think you especially will appreciate. That's got this really beautiful Merlot bloom in fall that starts white in July. And then Little Hottie that I mentioned is also Panicle. So if you're looking for a more compact one, it was bred at our farm in Athens, Georgia, specifically to stand up to that really hot Georgia summer heat planted in full sun and stays a beautiful crisp white all the way through. So there's a lot of fun new genetics that are out there. The one caveat I will say with new plants is just try and find the information on where they came from and the testing that was done, because we are really slow and intentional with introducing plants. The pop star that I mentioned, it took us 10 years of testing and trialing before we introduced it. Little Hottie, same thing, six, eight years because we really want to know that what we're putting out there and what we're saying is this attribute to make this plant better than all the other hydrangeas that are already out there. Like, we really want to know that that works. And so just ask questions. And most of the brands will all share that information with you. So just pay attention. But there's a lot of fun new stuff out there that just keeps getting better and better. Do you have a favorite? Is it cruel to ask you what your favorite is of all your children? Oh, it is. I mean, it is like <laughs> it is asking your favorite child. But because I am gone a lot in the summer, I really need something that I can just kind of leave. And I want to come home and have this beautiful flower show with the hydrangeas. So Popstar does that for me. I brought a test plant home a few years before we introduced it. And it was like leftover from a trial and like had been put in the toss pile. So like it hadn't been watered. It was not in good shape. I put it in the ground maybe watered it once. And I came back and not only was it leafed out again, and flowering again, it flowered like on the leaf axles as well, because it is that strong of a bloomer. So that's one of my favorites. And then my other favorite new one is Eclipse, which is new this year, that has like a dark purple, almost black leaf with a cranberry or amethyst flower on it. Ooh. So it is it's very dramatic. I love that. Well, and I and I, from what I've heard, goth gardening is a thing now. So people are trends. people are uh, goth gardening and creating these like dark, bra like black gardens. So that sounds cool. It's perfectly timed with the trend for this year to have this dark leaf hydrangea that's coming out. I know. Oh, my God. That is moody. I love it. How glamorous. <laughs> it's so good. So you obviously are a hydrangea expert, but you're an, a you're an expert in so many things. You're an author. Your book isn't about hydrangeas. It's about, you know, styling <laughs> with plants. So what is more about Ryan? Where can people find you? Where can people learn from you more? You're such a great educator. What are all the different ways we can come into Ryan's Ryan Plants Plants world. <laughs> that's it. RyanPlantsPlants.com on Instagram. That's where everything lives. And I love to talk with people about their gardens and answer questions and get inspiration. I love seeing all the projects that people are working on. And it's such a fun place to be able to stay connected. Mm -hmm. And what about your book? Tell us a little bit about your book. Yes. My book is called Field Guide to Outside Style. And when I initially started working on it, it really was like a guide for me 10 years ago. Like when I was just getting into this, when it can be really confusing and scary, when especially, you know, for people that are working with houseplants and starting to make that journey outside. Yeah, it can be expensive and scary, right? Yeah. And so that's really where it is. It's like that starting point of helping understand all these things that we just talked about, like, what does my space offer me with sun, soil, all of those, the weather, those really important foundational pieces. And then looking at like, what inspires me? What gets me excited? Whether it's 
I started with fashion, furniture, architecture, and like looking out in the real world, like what are the things that I love? And then bringing that into plants and combining that with what my space offers to us, what physically can we do? Then we layer in, here's the visual aesthetic that I really like. And then I have three different archetypes. One, Martha, which is like the cottage garden classic style. Kelly, which is a little more naturalistic, more densely planted, native plants. And then Tommy, which is like clean lines, more minimalist. And use these archetypes to help people say, okay, like I maybe I'm a little bit of that and a little bit of that. And then each of those archetypes talk about how they would use those different design elements in their space, provide some really fun plant combo ideas so that you have like a really good path to walk down as you start making that trip outside. Yeah, it's really more of a design book. I mean, there's plants in it, obviously, and there's lots of different planning things that you can do, but it really is more of a design book than a plant book, which I feel like you're right for us beginners moving outside when all of a sudden you have this blank canvas and you're like, what do I do? You know, (laughs) how do I not just make this look like an overgrown disaster? It's super helpful. So that's called Field Guide to Outside outside or Outdoor Style? Outside Style. Outside Style and Ryan Plants Plants. And if we are inspired by hydrangeas, please tell us again the brand name of your family's hydrangea company and what we should be looking for in the garden center. Yes, Endless Summer Hydrangeas are the reblooming big leaf hydrangea. You'll see them in the blue pot. And then if you like the panicle hydrangeas, the cone-shaped ones, like kind of like we're talking about a little bit of a starter plant, you can find those in first editions, shrubs and trees in the really bright purple pot in the garden center. Amazing. Well, thank you, Ryan. I hope you come back sometime soon for another chat. I would love to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan, for coming on the show. I really mean it when I say that he's like totally my plant friend. And I am holding out that I hope Ryan and I have the opportunity to sing planty songs together in the future. Stay tuned for that as I harass him about this idea that I have for the two of us to put together some songs. But anyway, he's such a great guy. You should go follow him on socials. We'll link everything in the show notes and get his book, which is so beautiful. It's a great coffee table book. He has great design tips. And get a hydrangea for yourself this year. I might be trying that pop star hydrangea. I'm going to talk with him as we get closer. I live in upstate New York. My final freeze is like June 1st. It's so far away. So I'm going to talk with him about which hydrangea I might try growing in a container this year. Stay tuned. Follow me on Instagram at Growing Joy with Maria to see what I grow. Because I do a lot of my like up-to-date garden updates and like houseplant updates just on Instagram. I hope this episode was so helpful. Let me know if I should bring Ryan back for a rose episode since his family's brand also has Easy Elegance Roses and what other episodes you might enjoy to help you keep growing joy. And in general, the door is always open for you to let me know what types of episodes you might like. You can either DM me at Growing Joy with Maria or you could just shoot me an email at Maria at Growing Joy with Maria. So I hope this episode was helpful. I can't wait to bring you another free episode next week. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss one because we've got some seriously amazing episodes in queue for you. And until next time, my sweet plant friend, I hope you keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's free. It's super fun. It takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're going to get your plant parent personality profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle, inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.